So as I said, I've also included uh, the first uh, 10 chapters of Mu as read by Mr. Noble. It's okay if you've already begun the book. I know many students have and many classrooms have, but I did want to take a moment and talk about some ways to interact with the book as you're reading it at home with your children, if you are. And we call those text connections. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those right now. Simply put, text connections refers to text, meaning the story or book you're reading, and the connections we make with ourself and that book. Text to self connections are connections that we make from a story that relate to our own life experiences and feelings. For example, if a character in the book has a dog and I have a dog, I've made a connection with that character. With text to text connections, you're connecting the book you're currently reading with a book that you've read in the past. For example, if you were reading Goldilocks and the Three Bears, you may make a connection with the three little pigs because they both have three animals in them. Text to world connections are really connecting a story that you're reading with anything that's happening in your world near or far. For example, if something that happens in a book you're reading has happened in the real world, there's a connection. So try out some text connections. Think aloud as you read along with your family, and I hope you enjoy the book. Moo, a novel by Sharon Creech. Chapters 1 through 10, as read by Mr. Noble. That Zora. The truth is, she was ornery and stubborn, wouldn't listen to anybody, and selfish beyond selfish and filthy, caked with mud and dust, and moody, you'd better watch it or she'd knock you flat. That's Zora I'm talking about. Nobody wanted anything to do with her. Zora, that cow. But first, before Zora, I am Rena, 12 years and two months old, formerly of a big city, a city of monuments, and people of many colors, a harlequin city of sights and noises, of museums and parks and music, and cockroaches and rats, and mosquitoes and crickets, and fireworks and traffic, and helicopters whopping overhead, and sirens screaming through the air. And that's how we lived for a time, me and my parents and brother, zooming on the subway or creeping along in buses or cars in, to, and around the city trawling through the museums, ogling the dinosaurs and artifacts, ambling through the zoo, listening to the roars and screeches and scrabbles and warbles, staring at the lazy crawls of bored animals. Yes, for a time, that's how we lived. Flight Path Then one day, we were stuck in traffic behind a tall gray bus spewing exhaust, with horns honking and people yelling and sirens wailing. On a day that was hotter than hotter than hot, my mother asked my father a question. A question can swirl your world. My parents had recently lost their jobs when the newspaper they worked for went out of business. We were on our way to drop my father off at another job interview. So, my mother said, do you still like reporting? Not so much, my father admitted. Is that what you see yourself doing 10 years from now? Um, because that's the flight path we're on. I was sitting in the back seat with my brother, Luke, a seven-year-old complexity. Sometimes he acted as if he were two and sometimes 12. He was full of questions and energy and opinions, except when you wanted him to ha have any of those things. Luke was drawing with, black, with a black marker in the yellow notebook that was nearly always with him. He drew for hours and hours, contorted heroes leaping and jumping and vaporizing, bizarre enemies with gaping mouths and sharp talons and horns, and complicated towns with alleys and bridges and dungeons. In the car, when Mom said, because that's the flight path we're on, Luke said, flight path? We're not in an airplane, you know? We're in a car and we're on the road. But I noticed that he was adding a runway and an airline to his airplane to his drawing. 
Drivers all around us were honking their horns like crazy, and the smells and the heat and the noise were pouring in the windows and squeezing us from all sides. Let's get out of here, my mother said. My father took his hands off the wheel and raised his palms to the sky. No, I mean, out of this city, my mother said. Let's move. To Maine, I said. My parents turned to look at me. Then they looked at each other. Then they looked at me again. Maine, they said, of course. My parents had met in Maine many years ago, and when they spoke of Maine, their voices had the glint of sea and sky. In the car that day, Maine just popped out of my head. I hadn't expected they would take me seriously. I'm glad I didn't say Siberia. Which is how? Which is how I came to meet Zora, though not quite so easily as it might sound, because first we had to give our landlord a month's notice, and then we had to clear out all our closets and cupboards and the dreaded storage garage. Then we had to lug some of that outside for a yard sale and the rest to the Salvation Army. And then we had to clean and watch as future renters tromped through our rooms, noting how small they were and how old and how dark, and it was embarrassing. And then there was the packing and moving of the beds and clothes and books and pots and pans. Oh, it hurts my head to remember it, so let's skip it. People said, my parents' friends said, are you crazy? And it gets cold in Maine, you know. And there are giant mosquitoes in Maine. And it gets cold in Maine, you know. And why, why, why? But some others said, they have a, lots of lobsters there. And great blueberries in Maine. And beautiful ocean and mountains. And great skiing. And lots of lobsters, lots of blueberries. Though... It does get cold there, you know. Luke said, how did this thing happen, this moving thing? In his yellow notebook, Luke drew a winged dragon, scaled in gold, flying through purple skies, grasp grasping a house, a car, beds, tables, and chairs in its black talons. Why Maine? Why did I say Maine that day? Let's move to Maine. Because I'd read a book about it. Three books, in fact. Two were stories about a family's life on an island in Maine, and one was a book of photographs of rocky shores and lighthouses and vast oceans with breaking waves and high blue mountains. And while I was reading those books and looking at those pictures, I was already there in my mind. I was clambering over rocks and wading in the ocean. I was hiking up a mountain and standing at the top, peering down the steep hillsides to the ocean beyond. I was there. Maine. It had such a sound to it, such a feel. And yet, I'd always lived in the city. I was full of buses and subways and traffics, traffic and tall buildings and crowds of people and city noises, honking and sirens and helicopter whirring and city smells, bakeries and car exhaust, hot dogs and coffee and city lights so bright. Was there room inside for the sights and sounds and smells of Maine? Would I know what to do and how to be in Maine? Friend Withdrawal The few friends I had didn't believe me when I told them we were moving to Maine. And then, when I'd convinced them, they acted excited about it. But as the days went by, I realized they were already forgetting me. It seemed they didn't want to waste friend effort on someone who was leaving town. One of them said, You're going to get all Maine-y. I wasn't sure what all many meant, but whatever it was, they had decided it was undesirable. My parents had a similar reaction from their friends. At first, people thought they were joking, and then they seemed excited and curious, but gradually, they became less and less interested. My mother was hurt by that, but my father said, maybe they're jealous, or maybe they feel you're abandoning them. When Luke told his latest friend, Toonie, that we were moving to Maine and that it was far away and he couldn't come over to her house anymore, she socked him on the nose and called him a stupid doofy head. When Luke told Dad about the, his encounter with Toonie, Dad said, well, who knows, maybe we're all stupid doofy heads. 
Welcome to Maine. With that white chalky paint that newlyweds write just married on their cars, we wrote, moving to Maine. And all along the way, as cars and trucks passed us, people honked their horns and waved. Some rolled down their windows and shouted, Maine! And some scribbled signs and held them up for us to see. Eat some lobster for me! And I love Maine! And we're so jealous! But one guy's sign read, It's cold there! At the border, we pulled over and posed beside the Welcome to Maine sign. People honked their horns like crazy as they sped past us. Maine! In a small town three hours up the coast, we parked by the post office and walked to a diner for lunch. And when we returned, there was a note on our windshield. Welcome to Maine. We hope you like it here. The ocean was a block away. You could smell that salty air. People were walking their dogs and their kids, and the church bells were chiming and the sky was blue. Maine! Dad stepped in dog poop that oozed into every crevice of his running shoes. But still, Maine, we made it. Harbor Town. It was the beginning of summer, and we thought we'd landed on another planet. A boat bobbing, sea salty harbor town with people strolling the docks, eating ice cream and lobster rolls. Gentle mountains rose up opposite the harbor and curled around it wrapping the town in their blue-green embrace. How exactly did we get here, Luke said. He drew towering mountains and steep cliffs above jagged rocks and tiny, fragile boats bobbing in the ocean below. We made our way to the place my parents had rented, a small house with a wood stove inside and an apple tree outside and a chipmunk on the doorstep and a chickadee nest in a lilac tree and spiders in the woodpile. That same day, our parents said, Go on, ride your bikes. Check out the town. We've got unpacking to do. Go. What? We said. By ourselves? In the city where we lived, there were few safe places for us to ride. Few places where we weren't competing with cars and trucks and buses and surprise clumps of kids armed with sticks and stones or wobbly bearded men spitting. But here, in this little town by the sea, there were wide sidewalks and quiet, curving lanes, spreading like tree limbs from the trunk of the town center, and you could ride and ride the whole day long. We rode down the streets and trails, discovering our new town, its people and dogs and old houses, its winding lanes and gnarled trees. One day, we passed a farm, and Luke shouted, Oreo cows! Black and white cows! Black in front and back, with a wide white fur belt, munched at the grass. A girl about my age, in rubber boots, stood near us, on the other side of the fence. Belted Galloways, they're called, she said. Or just Belties, for short. Purdy, right? A cow. Maybe I had imagined a cow was like a large lamb. Soft, furry, gentle uttering sweet sounds, but oh, not so, not so. One of the belted Galloways lumbered up to the fence and pushed its enormous head with its enormous nose toward us and uttered a deep, deep, loud moo, so loud and deep as if it were coming from low down in the ground and traveling up through the cow's legs and body and head and out of that enormous slobbery mouth. Moo, so loud and surprising that we jumped back, and the girl in the rubber boots gave us a pitying look, as if she were thinking, silly tourists. And I wanted to say, no, no, we're not tourists. We live here now. More cows ambled up to the fence, nudging their enormous heads and noses between the wires of the fence, and bellowing the loudest, deepest, loudest, Moose. Luke's hands were pressed tight against his ears. Flies dipped here and there amid the smell of cow dung. <laughs>